Thank you. Next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 6672 in the name of Linda Fabiani on fighting for tax jobs, fighting for tax justice. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Will those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Linda Fabiani to open the debate. Ms Fabiani, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. My motion begins with the standard Parliament welcomes in relation to the Public and Commercial Services Union report fighting for tax jobs, fighting for tax justice. Yes, I do welcome the information and clarity that this report brings in relation to the UK Government's rash and poorly consulted proposals. I do welcome the opportunity to air again this Parliament's disquiet and serious concern. I do welcome the cross-party commitment to question the UK Government proposals. I do not, though, welcome the fact that this debate is necessary about the slashing of taxation expertise and the effects that this will have on our country and particularly in some of our communities, like East Kilbride, the town that I am privileged to represent. The PCS report has been published following the business case put forward by the UK government, a modernisation plan intended to move to new online services data analytics, new techniques, new skills, and new ways of working. Of course, the main plan is to save money by closing local offices and replacing them with regional centres. Here in Scotland, the current HMRC sites will be reduced to three. East Kilbride is being dumped. There has been an HMRC presence in EK since 1969, commonly known as Centre One. And the workforce has an expertise that has been built up over all of these many years. I'm sure other members here will say the same of the HMRC offices in their respective communities. It's all very well for HMRC centrally to make assumptions about staff relocating to the regional centres. For example, East Kilbride workers to relocate to Glasgow. But as PCS makes clear, there has been no consultation with staff PCS have held extensive workshops across Scotland and collectively they have put forward solutions to the crisis in HMRC and tax delivery. But there has been no real attempt by HMRC or the UK government to question the logistics of the moves that they are talking about. No recognition of the expertise that will be lost, the dearth of experience that will result. And all of this in a time of uncertainty and change facing Scotland and the rest of the UK through Brexit. Within the last week, the head of the UK Tax Authority has, for example, warned that border and tax checks post-Brexit could require an extra 5,000 staff and that it could take between five and seven years to get a new streamlined system to deal with imports and exports properly in place. In January this year, the National Audit Office concluded that costs for the original plans have risen by more than half a billion pounds, more than half of which is the expense of funding new buildings. And this is all to a backdrop of UK government pledges to tackle tax avoidance and evasion. A Tory manifesto pledge to keep jobs in local communities and a recognition across the board that aspirations to digitisation are unrealistic and potentially damaging to many people. Recent research by a number of universities predicts that up to 35% of people will not be able to use digital for a number of reasons. As far as East Kilbride is concerned, there has been no government impact assessment. It's not just the jobs that will be removed from the town, it's the further impact, the effect on the local economy, an economy that has already suffered from losing major employers like Motorola and Rolls-Royce. One in ten jobs in East Kilbride are based in the tax office. And research indicates that one in four jobs in the town will be affected if these plans go ahead. As Scott Clark, PCS branch organiser in East Kilbride says, 2,700 people no longer contributing to the East Kilbride economy is a big hit to local businesses. As East Kilbride Task Force representative, former councillor Chris Thompson makes clear, 
East Kilbride stands to lose between 16.3 million and 30.7 million pounds from its economy. It's not just local representatives who are making the case that HMRC's business case for re relocation is fundamentally flawed. The House of Commons Committee of Public Accounts, their report earlier this year is very critical about the lack of robust business planning and goes as far as calling for a complete rethink of the business case. They have no faith in the savings projected by HMRC and they have scepticism about basing regional hubs in expensive cities, as they call it. They have concerns that HMRC's plan carries a high risk of disruption to its core business of collecting tax and serving customers. East Kilbride is a vibrant community presiding officer with an established tax expertise. Yet it's clear from the correspondence I've received via the UK government that to stay in UK has not even been considered as an option. Now I know that the main building is leased. I know it's an offshore company. But surely the UK government is capable of getting proper information to test the viability of maintaining that expertise in East Kilbride. The plans are wrong-headed, they're disrespectful to our town and to its workers and their families. Surely it would make sense for HMRC, as noted by the House of Commons Committee of Public Accounts, to reconsider whether moving to major city centres is the optimal way to deliver its objectives and achieve value for money. It should compare the costs and benefits of its chosen approach and the selected locations with alternative sites. Now, I know that this has already been done, reference other locations in the UK. That same respect should be shown to Scotland and to East Kilbride. I will end, presiding officer, by noting that the Stay in EK campaign was launched by our local paper, the East Kilbride News, last week. And I have no doubt that that campaign will be supported by everyone in our town. A petition is underway. I would ask the Scottish Government to continue to press the UK Government to consider the excellent report by the PCS Union and HMRC local staff and to listen to the many voices that genuinely believe that the HMRC plans are wrong-headed. I would ask the Scottish Government to urge the UK Government not to carry on regardless or even shorten the closure timescales, as I have heard rumoured. I would ask the Scottish Government to support our call to stay in EK. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes. Claire Hockey to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to congratulate Linda Fabiani on bringing forward this important motion for debate. Under reorganisation plans announced back in November 2015, 17 HMRC tax offices in Scotland will be closed by 2026, including Plaza Tower and Centre One in East Kilbride. The intention is to replace these 17 offices with just two centres in Glasgow and Edinburgh, which will see staff numbers fall from just under 8,000 to somewhere between 5,700 and 6,300. Therefore, under these proposals, in the region, over 2,000 jobs will be lost, including hundreds of jobs in East Kilbride, which will affect a significant number of people throughout my constituency of Rutherglen who are employed there. Apart from the effect on those who would lose their jobs the, and, the working, and on the working lives of those retained who will be working in a pressured environment with a quarter less staff, the closures will have a significant effect on both tax collection capability and the service to the public. Tax collection and the administration of the tax system are a core responsibility of government that generates the income required to provide the public services we rely on, including the health service, education, infrastructure and economic stimulation, as well as responsibilities that are currently reserved to the UK government. The current understaffing of HMRC is a major contributing factor in tax evasion and avoidance. And the ability of large corporations and some individuals to play the complex tax system to avoid paying the level of taxation they should be expected to do is deplorable. While tax avoidance is legal, it is morally indefensible. According to the House of Commons Library's recent analysis, it cost at least £12.8 
billion pounds between 2010 and 2015. Tax evasion is another area where billions of pounds are lost to the UK government each year. Evasion is of course illegal and one of the core responsibilities of HMRC is to investigate and recover these missing monies from the public purse. Between aggressive tax avoidance, evasion and other reasons that tax may go uncollected, it's estimated that the public purse loses out by approximately £34 billion every year. At a time when the UK government is focused on continuing austerity, which has seen a decline in living standards and rising levels of poverty, this is a stark statistic. These missing billions, if collected, would solve many of the issues currently facing our society, including health inequality, a fair and dignified social security system throughout the UK, as well as justice for the WASPy women, who have been unfairly robbed of their rightful pensions. And this is exactly why we need to retain trained and skilled tax collectors who have the specialist knowledge to investigate fraud and help increase the tax take. While enhanced computer and online systems have their place in making the service more, more efficient, you also need people to exercise judgment. As the PCS Union have pointed out in their report, Fighting for Tax Jobs, fighting for tax justice. These HMRC plans have been drawn up with little or no consultation with the Scottish Government, and this is unacceptable, particularly given the transfer of some income tax powers to this Parliament. The PCS have also highlighted the risks that these plans might have on the collection of the Scottish rate of income tax and the potential consequences on Scottish Government tax take. The centralisation of the two new Scottish mega centres in Glasgow and Edinburgh will disadvantage communities and taxpayers in other areas of Scotland, making the service more remote and inaccessible for many customers, whilst at the same time depriving tax collectors of vital local knowledge. Presiding officer, prior to the independence referendum three years ago, the security of HMRC jobs was held up as a reason for Scots to vote against independence. Like so many other vows given by Better Together during the campaign, this is another promise that lies in tatters. These proposals have been decried by the Scottish Government, unions and the National Audit Office, who have said that the HMRC plans are unrealistic and show no understanding of the impact on services. These plans will have a disproportionate impact on many communities with no tangible benefit. They will deprive Scotland of a vast wealth of skills and experience of tax administration. It will pile additional pressure on staff and lead to a potentially disastrous decline in customer service. On all these counts and on more, the HMRC should be sent home to think again. Thank you. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you. Can I first of all thank Linda Fabiani for bringing this debate uh, to Parliament. Linda and I um, have quite different political views, uh, but we're evidence that it's possible quite regularly, actually, for people in different parties to work together. Um, Linda's the constituency MSP for East Kilbride. Can you please there. use the full name? You, the full name of the member. I did. No, you're saying Linda. You're not using the full name. It's one of the protocols. It's for the OR. Linda Fabiani is the constituency MSP for East Kilbride, and I live there. I was a councillor there for 10 years and was instrumental in setting up the East Kilbride Task Force. This was formed when Rolls-Royce announced they were pulling out of the town. East Kilbride, Scotland's first new town, built 70 years ago, has, like many other places, suffered its share of job losses, but I still believe it's a vibrant town with a great future. HMRC has announced it wants to close down its huge operation there, part of the fabric of East Kilbride. Now, right from the start, I said I would back any campaign to keep those jobs in East Kilbride, but I made it plain that if there were to be any banner-waving protests, then I'd be an observer only. I've had private discussions with a government minister before the general election and HMRC officials and will revive that com contact. My view is that HMRC, like any organisation, is perfectly entitled to review its operations from time to time and perfectly entitled to conclude that they need to change the way they work. That's normal in private businesses and it need be no different in the public sector. However, I think their solution, closing their East Kilbride operation by 2025 and their Cumbernauld site to move jobs to Glasgow city centre is misguided. 
MPs on the Committee of Public Accounts produced a pretty damning report in April. Its summary read, and I quote, HMRC is one year into a 10-year plan to transform the way it collects tax. As part of this, it plans to reduce its 170 offices nationwide to 13 large regional hubs in city centres. We do not believe that it will save as much money as HMRC has predicted, and we are concerned that it has not thought through all the negative costs to the wider economy of its approach and the impact of local employment. Its conclusion is highly relevant. Uh, it said HMRC has yet to demonstrate that it has a realistic and affordable plan to deliver such a radical change to its estate, and we do not believe that it needs to be based in expensive cities across the UK. I agree with that. Glasgow city centre is expensive. It also said, quote, the government property unit should set out the rationale for having regional hubs and mini hubs and for determining their locations. It should also explain how it is taking into account the impacts on local economies when deciding how the government estate should be configured. It's that, no, I'm afraid I'm uh, out of time now, I think. It's that local impact that most concerns me and I've not seen any evidence so far that it will be mitigated. However, a letter to the committee of June the 16th from HMRC Chief Executive John Thompson makes it very clear that they're intent on proceeding. The same Mr. Thompson told me in December that, quotes, whilst East Kilbride might offer very competitive rent costs, it would not be right for HMRC to simply opt for the location that offers the cheapest property if an alternative site with slightly higher property costs offers a better overall net return for the exchequer. Now, I find that staggering. He also said that, quotes, as the local higher education facilities offer training in the skills HMRC needs, Glasgow would provide, his words, better access to a pipeline of talent that HMRC can attract and retain in future. Now that will be news to South Lanarkshire College and the University of West of Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'll continue to do all I can to assist with the Stay in EK campaign and I'll work with all parties in doing so. Thank you very much. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr Finlay, please. Thanks, President Officer. And I want to th again thank Linda Fabiani for bringing the motion before Parliament today. And with your uh, indulgence, I, I have to leave quite quickly after my speech uh, for another uh, appointment. I um, also would like to declare an interest as chair of the PCS Parliamentary Group, uh, PCS being the trade union that represents staff at HMRC. Um, I also want to thank the PCS for all the work they do uh, in so many areas, and uh, the report they've produced is evidence of that uh, good work. Um, the UK government's policy of tax office closures has impact on communities from Wick to Brighton. Uh, so many communities will or have been affected by these ill-thought-out and damaging proposals set out in the Build in the Future document. 160 office closures across the UK, uh, leaving 13 regional hubs. You don't build the future by destroying a vital public service that collects the taxes that pays for our services, services like schools and hospitals and police and fire services and all the rest of the services that civilise our communities. In my own region, the, there are planned closures at Livingston at Barbara Ritchie House and at the Pyramids Business Park at Bathgate uh, and in Edinburgh, at Elgin House, uh, Greyfield House and Meldrum House. Over, well over a thousand jobs, probably nearer two, uh, the, the thousand jobs, a thousand of them West Lothian alone, centralised to a new build office in the most expensive part of central Edinburgh. How on earth does this make any financial or operational sense? And the consequences for West Lothian will be grim. Each of those workers contribute £1,000 a year in local shops and bars and petrol stations uh, and the rest. All that money gone. With yet more workers and more traffic directed onto the already brutal journey uh, into central Ed Edinburgh along the AMA each morning. 
Or, of course, the displaced staff could take the train at £9.30 a day for a return ticket, 46 50 a week. No account taken of caring duties or the environmental impact or a whole series of knock-on effects. And I want to commend the PCS uh, branches up and down the country who have been working with councils and businesses and communities fighting this madness. Now, public sector jobs are being decimated across the board. Tens of thousands of jobs have gone in local government because of the austerity policies of the Tories, compounded by the policies of the Scottish Government. And the fire service, the police, their colleges uh, and councils have seen jobs shed across the board. Across the board. Yet no debates about any of that from government backbenchers to defend these jobs. I have worked cross-party with Fiona Hislop, with Angela Constance, with uh, the Green Party, with any of the politicians. We've been working together for a long time since this announcement was made, and I will continue to do that. But I have to say, within the PCS parliamentary group, we don't see any uh, SNP members attending our meetings or getting involved in our campaigns. They quite rightly, quite rightly, put the boot into the Tories on issues like this when it's the responsibility of the UK government, and I'm happy, more than happy, to join them. But on issues where it's their own government who are responsible for, for holding down Scottish civil service pay, or imposing cuts in pensions or cuts to posts, they are nowhere to be seen. I hope, I can, hope... I, can I, excuse me, can I ask the member, I appreciate some points you're making, but you are drifting more and more often I'm, off I'm, the I'm topic not, of not, the I'm, debate. I'm, yes, you are, Mr Finlay, this okay. is not a debate between you and me. OK, no problem. I hope that that changes. The PCS are quite right to demand a full equalities and economic impact assessment of these appalling and damaging proposals. Uh, jobs in the public sector should be located in areas to spread the economic benefit and support jobs and services, not centralised to further erode the stability of the local economy, local economies that have served our country's tax system well over the years. I thank Linda Fabiani for uh, supporting uh, PCS members in this campaign, and I hope she will do so again when the employer is her own government. I call Alison Johnson, followed by Marie Todd. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank Linda Fabiani for bringing this debate to the Chamber this evening and allowing us to once again raise our concerns about HMRC proposals to close tax offices and centralise them. Proposals optimistically entitled Building Our Future. Hmm. I think perhaps dismantling our future might be more appropriate. And I think Linda Fabiani eloquently expressed the devastating impact these proposals will have on communities across Scotland. Given the importance of tax collection and its administration to society as a whole, the lack of consultation is quite frankly breathtaking. The lack of appropriate public and parliamentary scrutiny is deeply worrying. And what about the health and the well-being of the staff who've been placed in this precarious position? It has been entirely disregarded. These proposals are determined that efficiency lies in replacing people with technology. Yet the international evidence suggests that digital technology has aided tax collection when accompanied with increases rather than decreases in staff numbers, a point forcefully made in the excellent PCS report. More can't be done with less money and less people. How can we possibly close the tax gap, the tax we're failing to collect, if we lose expertise? Expertise that has been collected over decades of work. Expertise that raises much needed revenue in this country. This comprehensive and well-researched well report fighting for tax jobs, fighting for tax justice, that we debate this evening rightly states that digitalisation is no alternative to human oversight and knowledge gained over decades, and it never will be. We've previously debated the proposal to close HMRC offices in West Lothian in a members' business debate brought by, by Neil Finlay, um, and moving them to Edinburgh. We debated that in this chamber, and the points that 
I and others made in that debate are worthy of repetition, not least because those with responsibility for this decision don't appear to be listening. And I will, I should say, will willingly join colleagues, cross-party colleagues, happily carrying a banner um, if we need to protest this further, because this decision cannot go unnoticed. Jobs should be shared across the country, not centralised further than the central belt. Now, I represent Lothian from West, West Lothian to Musselburgh in the east. We need jobs across Lothian. Why suck more into the centre? And I simply can't see that the centralisation that will take place here, just five minutes from here at New Waverley, makes sense. The, no the notion that offices off the Royal Mile, minutes from Princes Street, minutes from Edinburgh Castle, are cost-saving and less expensive than the current offices in Bathgate and, and Livingston. We really need to see the numbers because taxpayers are paying for this. The Keep Work in West Lothian campaign has done much to defend those based in Bathgate and Livingston and has made the case many times that increased travel times, childcare requirements would mean that workers take a pay cut of 8% or an average of £1,300 out of a salary of 21000 Concerns have been raised with me that those who are eligible for cash for excess fares might then lose out on tax credits. The people of West Lothian have the education, the skill and the expertise as proven and as is their commitment to this work. The costs to the local economy will be damaging. Many small local businesses will lose out. Folk pop in to buy a sandwich, to buy petrol, you know, to pop into to a local pub at the end of the day. And the impact of increased travel on our roads. Glasgow Road, one of the most congested in the UK, I believe second out of London. Well, I'd like David Mundell to try a commute any day this week. It takes an incredibly long time, and as Neil Finlay's pointed out, the train is an expensive option. Presiding officer, the term regional hub is a misnomer and a strange description for city centre centralisation. The case for this package of cuts hasn't been made, far from it, from it. Let's stop it and let's have a rigorous and independent review now. Thank you. Thank you. I call Marie Tor to be followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Linda Fabiani for bringing such an important issue to the Chamber this evening. The motion highlights the devastating impact that these job losses will have on communities like East Kilbride. I hope that all of us in the Chamber this evening can express support for PCS and wish them all the best in their negotiations with HMRC and thank them for their excellent report fighting for tax jobs and tax justice. Unfortunately, for folks in the Highlands, it's too late to save their jobs. Every member of staff in the Inverness HMRC office has accepted redundancy. Some have already left and the office will close in the next few months. Over 60 highly skilled jobs gone. I hope you'll indulge me as I focus on the experience of my own constituents in this Tory government centralisation scheme. To prepare for this debate, I spoke to a PCS union rep about the closure of the Inverness office. I heard about people who are facing real uncertainty in their lives at the moment, their situation seemingly worsened by the way it's been handled. Since 2015, the staff of Inverness HMRC office have been facing the reality of being made redundant as a result of the Building Our Future programme. The nearest regional centres to us will be in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Belfast, which means that most Inverness staff were unable to take up posts Staff have been promised support from HMRC, but in reality, the level of support that's been provided has fallen far short of what employees needed and wanted. Some employees in Inverness have accepted that their futures aren't with HMRC, and since 2016, since late 2016, they've sought to upskill themselves with little or no support from HMRC. At that time, the employees were advised that they'd be leaving HMRC in the spring of this year, spring of 2017, and yet they have only just received their voluntary redundancy offers. Having come to terms with the changes that lay ahead, many had started to move forward and even started to submit CVs and even applied for jobs. But because of the changes to the timeline that employees were given, lots of them have had to turn down offers of future employment because HMRC has changed when their employment will end. For over two years, they have faced uncertainty about their jobs, their financial security, and the impact that this would have on themselves and their families. Years of excellent public service ending like this. Not being informed, not being supported, 
HMRC moving the goalposts, and it is making employees feel undervalued and stressed. The process of redundancy is inevitably stressful, but when the process is not run properly, then it can have a serious impact on the mental as well as financial well-being of employees. I find one of the most baffling aspects of this whole episode just how the events of the last few years have unfolded. And I know I have mentioned that in this chamber before, but I know personally of folk who were promised that if they voted no in the independence referendum three years ago this week, their jobs would be safe. They have not forgotten those promises, and it is yet another aspect of this whole episode which is tough for them to take. Let me finish again by thanking Linda Fabiani and PCS for their tireless work on this issue. I hope that the folk of East Kilbride can be spared the human cost of this centralisation. And if so, that will prove some comfort to their colleagues in the North. Thank you. I call Bill Bowman, the last speaker in the open debate before the Minister closes. Mr Bowman. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And let me also thank Linda Fabiani for bringing this um, debate forward. Representing the North East, I am all too familiar with the effect of job losses on local communities. The last thing my constituents want is to see further job losses. Both Aberdeen and Dundee are amazing cities in which to live and do business, and both have had more than their fair share of job losses already. While the announcement of the location of the new Social Security Office in Dundee is most welcome, recent months have not been good for Dundee, where HMRC employs over 500 people, due to a number of recent job losses more than 250 from Lloyds, and just a few weeks ago, almost 100 from Scottish Electrical Group. Unfortunately, HMRC plans to close one office in Dundee, whilst another is transferred to the Department of Work and Pensions, although thankfully it seems most of those jobs will be kept. I recognise that HMRC must adapt to changing circumstances, and it is perfectly reasonable for HMRC, like any other organisation, to examine the way it operates and try to improve. That is fair enough. It is... Please. Claire Hockey. I thank the member for taking the intervention. And uh, I hear that um, you've echoed uh, your colleague Graeme Simpson's uh, words there saying about it's perfectly reasonable for HMRC to review their business model. However, having heard what you've heard this evening from myself, from Linda Fabiani and Marie Todd about how HMRC have been treating their staff would you, and the, the trade union involved, would you still accept that they are acting in a perfectly reasonable manner? Mr Bowman. Thank you for that intervention. Let me continue to say that it is equally fair though to examine that process and to raise questions about areas that we have concerns over. For example, about how the effects of closures on local employment and economies will be properly addressed. So too, there are questions over the potential loss of specialised local knowledge and the impact that might have on excise and tax avoidance work. Local impacts will be felt most keenly and we must engage with one another if we are to find solutions for the communities affected. Sadly though, neither the motion nor the report that it's based on lend themselves to inspiring an environment of cooperation in this chamber. The language is extreme, the tone hostile, and the motivation of the organization behind this report is political. The report is not a considered response, it is a cynical response. Management is only seen as being bad. Edinburgh, it is inferred, is undeserving of new jobs. And the reason, a relatively high average disposable income in the city. Sorry, yes. Alison Johnson. Uh, just briefly, does the member not acknowledge that there has been a woeful lack of consultation and such lack of consultation and disregard for the views of those working in this service, you know, are bound to be met with a degree of frustration so I do not share the member's interpretation of the, of the report. Uh, thank you for that. Mr. Bowman. Thank you for that intervention. I think, to a certain extent, your language there is quite extreme. And if we're trying to find a way to, to work forward, then we need to use language that we can all adopt. I mean, I've read, I hope you've read the report as well. Um, as I say, it says that Edinburgh is undeserving of new jobs because 
the relatively high average disposable income in the city. Is that, does that mean everyone in Edinburgh is rich? There's also what I would call a bizarre reference to private schools thrown in for good measure from the, the report writers. None of this helps to raise support for the jobs Linda Fabiani is concerned about, and the people who will be affected, I think, deserve better. Uh, I, do I have extra time? Yes. Sorry. The yes, sorry, you did take two interventions. Yes. Okay, thank you. The fundamental principle here should be how best to protect local jobs, address valid concerns amongst the workforce and support our communities. Those things are not achieved by pushing party political part, um, politics on the issue, suggesting some are less deserving of jobs than others or promoting a trade union's radical political objectives. They are accomplished by cooperation and consensus, by reasoned rational debate, and by standing up for the people that matter most, our own constituents. Like my colleague Graham Simpson and East Kilbride, I stand ready to work alongside any other parties to keep jobs in the North East and other local communities, and I hope that others do too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Bowman. And I'll call Jamie Hepburn to close with the Government. Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And, uh, can I begin by joining others in thanking Linda Fabiani for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber? Just as she said uh, at the outset, I don't particularly welcome the fact that this debate is uh, necessary. I very much regret that we are here uh, uh, as well, but uh, this debate is uh, necessary, so it is right that we have had the chance to, to uh, discuss this uh, issue uh, this evening. Can I uh, welcome uh, the contributions that have uh, been made almost uh, universally? I'll come to Mr Bowman's contribution in a few uh, moments' time, but uh, the debate, the tenor of the debate today has very much reflected, uh, I think, the debate that this Parliament held uh, in October 2016 when there was a cross-party a consensus concern about the impact of these uh, 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 changes. Uh, uh, let me pick up on the language that was deployed uh, by uh, both uh, Mr uh, Bowman and Mr Simpson. And I should uh, caveat that I think the general thrust of Mr Simpson's contribution today is one that I very much welcome, and I will return to that uh, in a few moments. But where they both said it was uh, appropriate for HMRC to review their business model. I suppose in some senses uh, I would not disagree with that general uh, sense, but surely taking on board the points that Alison Johnston has made at a, a time where uh, we rightly see concerns uh, of from great public concern actually about the, uh, the fact that many, too many taxes go uncollected. We see significant tax uh, avoidance then it, we must question the sense of a business model which is going to see further reductions in the numbers of HMRC employees, as will be the case with this a programme. We see that through the creation of the two, if what are euphemistically referred as uh, regional centres, I think the terminology that was deployed by Claire Hockey, mega centres uh, were uh, rather more apt. Uh, Alison Johnson was quite correct to say the term regional hub is uh, somewhat uh, strange. We, they are uh, anticipated to accommodate between uh, 5,700 to 6,300 staff, when we know right now there are over 8,000 HMRC staff employed in Scotland. So there's going to be a reduction in a uh, headcount, and that continues the trajectory of reduced uh, the number of employees uh, in HMRC over a number of years, not uh, begun by this current UK government administration, I would uh, concede begun by the previous Labour administration, of course. I'll give Graeme Simpson. Uh, can I thank Jamie Hepburn for taking the intervention. Um, would he accept that what, what I was said in my speech was that it's um, perfectly right for any organisation, governments included, to review the way they, the way they operate, uh, but that I also said that I disagreed with the conclusions of this review, um, which I'm entitled to do as a locally elected politician, um, I think the conclusions of this review are wrong. Ye yes, Minister. I, would, I would concede that, and I suppose that's why I was, uh, with all due respect to Mr Bowman, that's why I was drawing a distinction between your contribution, Mr Simpson, and your esteemed colleague, Mr Bowman's uh, contribution uh, th this evening. Uh, let me uh, say, I, uh, I um, uh, in that regard, I should say that, uh, when we talk about uh, reviewing business models, I think there's a clear, compelling case. We've heard it uh, this evening that uh, should cause the UK government to pause for thought. I am, of course, responding uh, this evening, President Officer, on behalf of the, the Scottish Government. I've got a clear ministerial interest in my 
uh, with my responsibility for uh, employability, there's going to be a direct impact on employment across Scotland through these changes. I, I should, of course, also say that I speak uh, as a constituency representative in the case of HMC because uh, the uh, second uh, largest uh, single site that will be affected by these changes is uh, located after Centre One in, in Ms Fabiani's constituency it is located in my own. So this is a, a very real issue of a concern, one that I know that is causing a considerable concern to the workforce. In that regard, I want to thank the PCS for uh, their uh, work, for the report they have uh, laid before us that they have submitted to for the consideration of the UK government and indeed for this government to consider as well. And I'll try to come to that uh, in a few uh, moments uh, time. Uh, but in that regard, this is where I thought Bill Bowman's uh, contribution this evening was extraordinary, rather peculiar, for him to uh, suggest that what has been laid out by uh, the PCS is extreme and is a radical political agenda is something I think is an ex it's one of the most extraordinary things, frankly, I've actually heard it's set out by any member in my time in this chamber. What the Public and Commercial Services Union are doing here is representing the interests of their members. They are acting in the fashion you would expect a trade union to act. That is not a radical political agenda. It is representing uh, those of their members as you would uh, expect. And I think we should put in the record, I'm sure PCS would, uh, and I see some of the representatives in the, the public gallery this evening, they may well be writing to you, Mr Bowman, but I, uh, I thought it was... Uh, uh, very strange for you to set out that they have said that Edinburgh is undeserving right. of additional jobs. I have read it, I've got the page here, nowhere can I see it, and you know, I've, I've read it quickly, so I, I remain to be uh, corrected if I've got it wrong. Nowhere on this page do I see the word undeserving. What I think they are doing is reflecting the concern that ex there are a, a number of existing communities that benefit by uh, Bathgate, uh, Livingston uh, are the, 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 the primary examples uh, in this case that uh, benefit by having uh, the uh, jobs located there just now and why would those communities have to suffer the benefit by relocating those jobs to uh, another location uh, which might not be as economically disadvantaged already as those other communities. In that regard, I should uh, pay tribute to uh, those are my colleagues, uh, Fiona Hislop, who's sitting right next to me right now in terms of the campaigning they've undertaken for their communities in uh, West uh, Lothian. Um, let, me, uh, let me turn to uh, the report that's been laid out because uh, I did uh, concede that it called on the Scottish Government to undertake uh, certain things. It call, called on us to interact with the UK Government to call a, a halt in these uh, uh, this uh, process. We've done that. The First Minister spoke personally to the Second Permanent Secretary at HMRC. The Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work has written to the Financial Secretary to Her Majesty's Treasury to, to seek a meeting to discuss these matters in, in some detail. I have to say the response was rather negative and it was very interesting to hear that Mr Simpson has been able to secure a meeting to discuss this with the relevant minister in the UK government and I, in private indeed, and I look forward to his assistance in ensuring that the Scottish Government, the elected Scottish Government, can set out its position to uh, the UK Government uh, uh, as well. The report also uh, talks about whether um, the HMRC in Scotland should be, continue to be under control of the UK Parliament or whether its powers should be transferred to Holyrood. The Scottish Government, of course, supports uh, that aim. I, I, I'm very clear that powers to collect and manage all taxation raised in Scotland should become uh, the preserve of uh, the Scottish Government and the legislative responsibility of uh, this part. The report calls the abandonment of costly PFI programmes for office buildings. This, again, is something that uh, the Scottish Government uh, 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 supports uh, and has, of course, put in place through our own uh, uh, programme of uh, construction. So let me say I very much welcome uh, the report that's been put in place. I think it is the report from the PCS that has been put in place. I think it is unfortunate they've had to do so because I very much regret the approach that the UK government has uh, taken here. So let me close by reassuring uh, Linda Fabiani. She has called upon the Scottish government to continue to press uh, the UK government on this matter. I can certainly assure her that it's something we'll continue to do. Thank you. That concludes the debate. I close this meeting of Parliament.